former South Sudan Vice President Riek Machar defends his declaration of war against the government of President Salva Kiir. He spoke to VOA. In a fiery speech, First Lady Michelle Obama takes on Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump. And the Nobel Committee bestows the Literature Prize to an American music legend. Does this mean that the times they are a change in? Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. Now we begin in South Sudan where tensions remain high as clashes between government forces and rebel groups continue in parts of the country, raising concerns about a return to all-out conflict. Opposition leader Riek Machar, who fled the capital Juba in July, is now in South Africa to receive medical treatment. Machar initially traveled through the bush from South Sudan to Democratic Republic of Congo, sustaining a leg injury on the way after an aide said his group had been pursued by forces loyal to his rival, President Salva Kiir. In September, Mr. Machar and his group, SPLMIO, declared war on the Salva Kiir government. John Tanza, host of VOS South Sudan in Focus Radio program, reached Machar by phone in Johannesburg. The partners to the peace agreement, including the members of the IGAD Plus, have issued a statement denouncing that option you are looking for, where you say you want to change the regime by force. They are denouncing that, saying South Sudan does not need war. South Sudan needs a peaceful dialogue. How do you react to that? I believe that the, these are double standards. There is war going on in South Sudan since the 8th of July. They all know it. I'm not starting a new war. It was started by Selfa before that. I am surprised when they don't read the things correctly. They should read things correctly. There is war in South Sudan. The fact that uh, President Selfa appointed Taban, uh, who is uh, a, a conspirator with him, as first vice president, doesn't stop the war. The SPLAIO has been there, and the SPLA has been fighting the SPLAIO. They all know that. If I, as a first vice president, would be pursued by ground forces and, uh, uh, and by air, what is the intention? And he, we were communicating, telling him, look, that we must find a way to talk and bring this crisis to an end. After the Juba incident, he knows that. If I stop communication, it was after I found that his plan was to replace me with another person who has conspired with him to kill me in day one. Well, John Tanzo now joins me in studio to tell us more about his interview with Mr. Michel. John, welcome. Thank you. I've got a scoop there. I don't, I don't think you've spoken a lot since he left Juba. Yeah, the last time I spoke with him was on the 15th of uh, May, just uh, 15 days after the transitional government of national unity was formed in Juba. And after that, my attempts to speak to him were not successful. Yeah. And since he fled Juba, he has not been speaking, I mean, given the conditions under which he was and he was not able to speak. When he came to Khartoum, he yeah. was sick, and yeah. the Sudanese authorities also requested that he should be tight-lipped while he's in Sudan. Yeah. Now, we know that, um, you know, the situation between him and Machar and, and Kira hasn't been so good, but one hoped that perhaps he wasn't that serious when he declared that war. It looks like there is no other way. He's so determined to go to war with Machar. He, uh, with he was Salva telling King. me that uh, fighting has been going on in South Sudan right from the time he returned from Addis Ababa after signing the peace agreement. He told me that his forces have uh, been constantly under attack from the South Sudan army. And uh, he said the international community is not talking about that. They are only looking at what he's saying. And uh, he went on to say that he's declaring war because that's the only option left on his table. That's the only way they know how to communicate. But here's a question. Uh, they signed a peace deal. In fact, this man eventually came together and they formed a government. Uh, what did he say has uh, led to this continued fighting? Is there any point at which they actually both laid down their weapons and lived in peace? There was a ceasefire. After they signed the peace agreement, there was a ceasefire. But remember, President Kiir had uh, told the world on the 26th of uh, 
August in Juba that uh, the peace agreement it has he has reservation on, reservations yeah. on the peace agreement and uh, when he signed it he said the peace agreement is not going to be implemented he said it is designed in a way that it will be difficult to implement and right after Riyak Machar came in on the 29 they formed the government of uh, transitional government of national unity they were supposed to sit down and discuss pending issues for instance Machar's forces were supposed to be con uh, in a cantonment area South Sudan army was supposed to withdraw 25 kilometers outside Juba town. That did not happen. Yeah. And then when they were busy discuss, um, negotiating the peace agreement in Addis Ababa, President Kir issued a decree partitioning South Sudan into 28 states. Without the agreement says the South Sudan will be based, the agreement was based on the 10 states. Yeah. So Machar and Kir did not agree on the 28 states. There were issues to do with the reintegration of the army and reforms in the institutions. That did not happen within that short mm -hmm. period. And so the two leaders did not agree on a lot of things. And that was the beginning of the uh, disagreement. This gentleman, I've been talking to the regional forces, the international community of this time. Uh, now, uh, w w what is it that uh, Machar says could be done to avoid war? Uh, I mean, has he explored every possibility? Well, he. Talking to him yesterday, he said his option number one is to implement the peace agreement. And uh, he went on to say in the event that President Kir does not want to implement the peace agreement, then he will declare war mm -hmm. on the government so, and possibly change it. Is he open to like a dialogue, you know, yet again with Mr. Yes, Kir? Yes, he, he said the Troika countries, the Iga countries, the African Union and the UN that came with an idea of a regional protection force should create a forum for dialogue for so. other political forces in the country to discuss what happened in Juba, why and how, so, so. that they can come to an end to this uh, stalemate. All right, so now the ball is on Mr. Kerr's government. John, thank you very much for sharing My pleasure. Uh, your interview with us. My pleasure. Uh, that um, uh, John Tanza is host of VOA South Sudan in focus radio program here at the Voice of America. Now, Kenya plans to shut the Dada refugee camp by the end of the year. The camp is home to nearly 300,000 people, mostly from Somalia. Kenya, which says it needs close, uh, to close the camp due to security concerns, has agreed along with Somalia and the UN Refugee Agency to a policy of voluntary repatriations. But the plan is already hitting some snags. VOA continues its look at the issue with this report from Jason Patinkin in Kismayo, where returnees from the DAB say things aren't as good as they had hoped. In the last year, over 16,000 refugees from Dadaab have come to Kismayo in Somalia's Jubalands region. Some say they chose to leave because aid groups have cut rations. But once in the city, those without family to take them in have found themselves living in overcrowded camps. Hubi Abdullahi Aden spent 25 years in Dadaab. She says she regrets returning to Somalia. <laughs> We were promised a lot of things. There would be a house, and we'd be provided with the basics. Now there's no toilet, there's no water, there's no house. The promises that were made by the UN for education, health, job creation, anything that would move our lives forward were not fulfilled. Aden's main concern is education for her seven children, six of whom were born in Kenya. She says Kismayo has no good schools available for them. I would like to go back to Kenya, to take them back to the school, but the situation does not allow me. The problem is Kismayo's already overtaxed public services can't absorb returnees from Kenya. The relatively peaceful city already hosts 40,000 internally displaced people who have fled war and drought in Somalia. More continue to arrive every day. Awis Ahmed Abdi, a health worker for the American Refugee Council, which runs clinics in the camps, says the group isn't equipped to treat the returnees, too. Every day the population is increasing from the returnees, and the needs also increase the same. Sometimes in a day almost maybe over 100 billion turn up for this, uh, for this consultation per day. So it, the need will be more than what it was required. 
For now, the government in Kismayo has suspended more returns until the international community and Somalia's government meet the needs of the people already in the IDP camps. But Ahmed Mohamed Abuker, chairman of the returned refugees in Kismayo, says Kenya must also stop trying to close Dadaab. <laughs> To the Kenyan government, to be honest, we're thankful. We're requesting, as your brothers and your neighbors, that you have taken care of us for over 20 years, but you don't end an old relationship in a shameful way. Please take care of the refugees the way you did before until our government has put its feet out on the ground. But for returnees, going back does not appear to be an option. Jason Patinkin for VOA News, Kiss Mayo. Well, Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has denied Ethiopian accusations that his country was supporting the opposition after a wave of violent protests that left hundreds dead. Ethiopia accused elements in Eritrea, Egypt and elsewhere on Monday of being behind protests over land grabs and human rights that prompted the government to declare a state of emergency. The unrest has cast a shadow over Ethiopia and the government faces criticism at home and abroad over its authoritarian approach. Our forces uh, unleashed uh, in uh, Ethiopia that uh, uh, deserve um, to uh, be uh, addressed. Uh, the country uh, has uh, a need to uh, continue to move forward uh, on uh, expanding and, uh, and uh, strengthening its uh, democracy and, and improving uh, its uh, human rights uh, performance. Uh, if uh, it uh, continues to face uh, uh, insecurity and instability uh, in uh, various parts of the country, it will undermine the country's uh, enormous uh, progress uh, in the economic and social areas that it has uh, experienced. Well, Ambassador Johnny Carson is former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. U.S. markets opened sharply higher on bank earnings and retail sales data. Traders are now pricing in an interest rate hike. Uh, for more on the impact on Africa, business correspondent Jill Malandrino reports from New York. Good afternoon for the NASDAQ market site. I'm Jill Malandrino. All three major averages in the U.S. are trading higher on strong retail sales data and really good bank earnings out of J.P. Morgan and Citigroup. Joining me today is Bob Lang of ExplosiveOptions.net. Bob, one thing we focus a lot when we talk about the continent is the impact of the dollar on local currencies, since most of the countries are importing countries. Should we get that rate hike, and there's about a 70% chance that we will in December, how would that impact the dollar, and how would that inherently impact local currency? Well, we should see the, the dollar rise when the uh, interest rates go up, much like it did last year in December of 2015. We saw the dollar take off to the upside in front of that rate hike, but then also follow on and go up, go up much higher. And we did see some data in the first quarter of uh, 2016 that showed that exports from other countries actually rose with that stronger dollar. So that makes sense. And we, when we see a stronger dollar that makes put some pressure on U.S. companies on their exporting as well, too. So a, a weaker dollar actually is better for exports, but a, a, lot, a stronger dollar for uh, U.S. companies is actually very, very poor. So how would that impact a country like Nigeria, for example, that is a majority importer, the weaker dollar would be beneficial correct. to their economy. That's correct. Yeah, but then, of course, you know, Nigeria is also a big exporter of crude oil as well, too, mm -hmm. right? So we saw crude oil have a big rally in 2016 already. I think it's up uh, close to 50 to 55 percent. So I'm sure that they're, they're benefiting by a stable and stronger dollar over the, the year right. of, of 2016 than they, than they would with the dollar uh, coming down. Because, I mean, crude oil is really tied into currencies as well too. So when, when crude oil, um, for instance, like Nigeria, is um, is going is going higher with the uh, with the with the um, stronger dollar, right. that's definitely a benefit for uh, for their exports. And finally, to the consumer, a stronger dollar with. If, if we get a weaker dollar, should we get the interest rate hike, that yes. would be good for local currency because correct. they'd have more purchasing power. That's correct. Yeah, th those currencies are going to rise versus the, uh, versus the rest of the other basket of currencies in the, uh, uh, around the world. And, yes, it's definitely much more uh, beneficial for, uh, for the right. local currencies. And real quickly, since we have you at the NASDAQ all the way in yeah. from California, in a quick 15 seconds, what's your outlook for the remainder of 2016 for the U.S. markets? For 2016 U.S. markets, I think it's going to be pretty volatile, but I do think that we have some upside, probably 3 to 5% 
represent more upside in the S&P 500 and the, uh, the Dow Industrials. Okay, thanks very much, Bob. Thank you, From Jill. the NASDAQ market site in Times Square, New York City, I'm Jill Melandrino. U.S. First uh, Lady Michelle Obama told Clinton supporters in the northeastern U.S. state of New Hampshire that Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump's comments on women could not be dismissed as just another disturbing footnote in a sad election season. This was not just a lewd conversation. This wasn't just locker room banter. This was a powerful individual speaking freely and openly about sexually predatory behavior and actually bragging about kissing and groping women using language so obscene that many of us were worried about our children hearing it when we turn on the TV. During a rally for Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton in Manchester, the First Lady said Trump's words have shaken her to the core. The shameful comments about our bodies the disrespect of our ambitions and intellect, the belief that you can do anything you want to a woman, it is cruel, it's, it's frightening, and the truth is it hurts. In interviews with the New York Times Wednesday, two women accused Trump of allegedly touching them inappropriately, claims a Republican nominee spokesman called fiction. The report was followed by a stream of similar allegations from several other women, putting more pressure on Trump as he lags Clinton in national opinion polls. The campaign was already struggling to contain a crisis after a video surfaced last week showing the candidate bragging in 2005 about groping women and making unwanted sexual advances. Trump's campaign released a letter his lawyer sent to the newspaper demanding the news organization retract the story calling it libelous and threatening legal action if it did not comply. An opinion poll showed one in five Republicans thought Trump's comments about groping women disqualified him from the presidency. The poll also showed him eight points behind Clinton among likely voters. Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at voavince McCorry. Coming up, the music of Mali with uh, Mamadou Kelly and his group, Van Kaina. Stay with us. to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. Welcome back. It's Music Makers time, and today we bring back Mamadou Kelly and his group by Band Kaina. Now, they were recently hosted by Music Time in Africa, uh, Africa's Heather Maxwell, and she is here to tell us more about them. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. Yes. So this is a group that we've seen before. Yes, I about three we, years ago. Yeah, we featured them. Yes, we did. They're back in Washington. Yep. What brings them here? They were back on another tour for mm -hmm. the release of their second album called Jamila. Jamila. Yes. Sounds like a name. Perhaps it means something else. It means beautiful woman, actually. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And uh, they had time with you in the studio. They performed. So uh, anything you could tell us about the song we're just about to watch? Well, the song is called uh, Ne parle tout ce qu'on voit in, mm -hmm. in French. In English, what it means is don't say everything that you see. Mm -hmm. That's so. a... And a proverb. Don't say everything. Yeah, Don't sometimes say everything. it's better so, just sometimes to it backfires. Yourself. Exactly. <laughs> so let's see how they bring that that out in the song uh, it, while when they were performing in your studio. There we go.
sounds really, really authentic Malian music. And so you can just uh, share with us why such guys actually persist with this kind of music when other people, especially the younger generation, are kind of moving on to some other things. I think a lot of it is um, the love they have for their tradition. It's a regional music. Yeah. It's from the northern part of Mali in the desert. And actually, the term desert blues was coined based yeah. on this kind of music that was really became known to the world by Ali Farka Toure, the late Ali Farka Toure. And um, so it's a, it's a long tradition. It, it's music that's made in northern Mali. It makes sense to the environment, to the pace of life. Um, and people, they love their music. They would never yeah. let this go. Yeah, I mean, it's the kind of music you wish you could find in most of the African countries because in many others, it is kind of disappearing because the younger generation are overwhelming this with the new, you know, hip-hop and mm -hmm. uh, really more... True, true. I mean, there is a big hip-hop, you know, sector in yeah. Bamako, but mostly among young people. Yeah. Um, but they also, these musicians, they also have apprentices and they... Yeah. And they I don't know, Mali's keep, always had a really strong keep, music keep tradition. keep the tradition going. Yeah. Thank you very much, Heather, for sharing this with us. My pleasure. Yes. Well, and that's uh, uh, Heather Maxwell. And now to learn more about um, Heather Maxwell herself and our VOA radio show, you want to visit Facebook and type in the keywords Music Time in Africa. You can see what time her program can be heard in your area. Get more information about some of our featured artists. Well, it's uh, time now for a short break, still to come, on Africa 54. An American music icon is awarded a Nobel Prize, and it seems like everyone has something to say about it. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headline. In Rwanda, environmental leaders, delegates and diplomats meet for the second and last day in Kigali to try to reach a deal on reducing hydrofluorocarbon or HFC. German Chancellor Angela Merkel meets with Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari on Friday in Berlin. In Nigeria, a group campaigning for the release of more than 200 schoolgirls held by Boko Haram militants celebrate that 21 of the girls have been freed. Finally, in Rwanda, medical delivery drones take flight over the country, in the first instance delivering batches of blood to 21 clinics. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Can you remember the last time the Nobel Prize for Literature kicked up a controversy? Now the announcement that iconic singer-songwriter Bob Dylan had been awarded the prestigious prize set off a firestorm of reaction on social media with fans celebrating while critics debated whether a songwriter deserved a prize for literature. Dylan was awarded the prize for having created new poetic expressions within the American song tradition. The debate over whether Dylan is a songwriter or a poet has been going on for decades. In the past, Dylan himself has rejected both labels. He is the first American to win the prize since 1993. Well, next up, greasy fire treats are usually one of the highlights of going to a yearly fair 
in the United States. Now, the, may, the man who became famous for his decadent deep-fried creations has opened a restaurant in Texas that serves them all year-round. The aptly named State Fair treats features gooey and greasy offerings like cookie fries or deep-fried cookie dough shaped like crinkle-cut potatoes. Another favorite is the Texas Blue Bonnet, uh, which is a blueberry scone that is stuffed with white chocolate and blueberries, deep-fried, then topped with more chocolate and whipped cream. Well, and finally, uh, the final trailer for Rogue One, a Star Wars story, has been released. Rogue One is uh, set just uh, before 1997 Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. In the new film, the Jedi's are all but extinct, the old Republic is in turmoil, and the threat of the Death Star is looming. Uh, Darth Vader also makes a brief appearance in the trailer, though it is not yet known how much screen time the legendary villain has. What is known is that Vader will once again be voiced by veteran actor James Earl Jones. The movie hits theaters in December, and that is what is trending today. Well, and that's our show for today. Now be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings to Daybreak Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC. That is Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words. Here is Ambassador Ryan Crocker speaking about Iraq. We're at an extremely delicate time throughout the region, certainly in Iraq, as the Iraqis struggle to, uh, to form a government that needs to be inclusive enough that it will bring the Sunnis back into the process. Delicate. Something that is delicate can break easily. The ambassador says that the situation in the region must be handled very carefully. Delicate also can mean pretty. A delicate object is pleasing to look at and carefully made. Now the next time you hear the word delicate, delicate, you will know what this news word means and you can use it in a conversation.